Hello. I would like to welcome you to Men and Women in Ministry. Typically, Betty Graham would be with us, but uh, Betty has a, uh, a leg injury that she's recovering from, so I would like to ask you to uh, keep her in your prayers. My name is Peter Schneider. I am with Bethel House of Refuge in Muhammad, Illinois, and Living Word Omega Message uh, Church, also in Muhammad, Illinois. I do in prison and post prison ministry, and have ex studied extensively about the tabernacle for around 30 years. Also, um, you'll see me referring to notes in the Bible today. We will be studying um, specifically regarding the golden altar of incense. Our previous programs, we have talked about the um, symbolic meanings of the pieces of furniture that are in the Tabernacle of Moses, also all of the dimensions, and we will also be discussing uh, many other things in the, the weeks to come. So we just invite you to get your Bible and sit down with us, and let's, let's go over the Word. Uh, I'd like to begin just with a, uh, just a moment of prayer. Father, we're so thankful uh, for your goodness to us. We would ask, Lord, that you open our minds that we might hear the voice of the Holy Spirit and receive that which you are bringing to us today. We want to lift up our uh, dear sister Betty, that you would touch her body and strengthen her for the work of the ministry whereunto she has been called. Bless her, O God, and direct her path and Henry according to your will and purpose in Jesus' name. Now, our last program, we had talked about the... Um, table of showbread and the um, golden candlestick, which you see here. These are miniature forms. This is the candlestick. These are models. This is a table of showbread, which these two things speak of feeding on Christ and the union with Christ, becoming one in Christ. Jesus' prayer in John Chapter 17 was that they might be one even as you and I are one. And so the process of the Holy Spirit and the life of the believer is to bring us into a place of oneness in Christ. And so that's, that's what this study is about. That's what the tabernacle of Moses is, is somewhat like the blueprint for the plan of God for each and every individual. And so we'd like to really um, today discuss the golden altar of incense. What you see here is the Ark of the Covenant, which is the Ark of the Covenant and the mercy seat are the only pieces of furniture in the holiest of all. So there was a veil here, and there were pillars here. There was a veil on the outside of the holy, uh, holy place, which would, in type and shadow, the tabernacle of Moses described the whole man, the holy of holies, spirit, the holy place, soul, the outer court, the body. And so each one of the, um, the pieces of furniture will be describing and dealing with um, many of the aspects of the individual in that area, um, the the gold, uh, the uh, brazen altar, the br uh, brass altar, on the outside talks of man's initial move into the things of God, and the the um, the outer footprint of the tabernacle was a hundred cubits by fifty cubits, and there were uh, hangings made of cloth that were on the whole outside that would be a type of the closing in of man into God. And that's God's desire to bring us into a place of unity and oneness with him. And so he described it in the tabernacle. And today we are going to discuss the um, meaning of, the aspects of the golden altar of incense. Now the golden altar of incense, let me read what it is. It's in Exodus 30, one through six. And thou shalt make an altar to burn incense upon of shittim wood shalt thou make it. A cubit shall be the length thereof, and a cubit the breadth thereof. Four square shall it be. It's going to be a square, and exactly precise, the same way. And two cubits shall be the height thereof. The horns thereof shall be 
the, of the same, and thou shalt overlay it with pure gold. So what you have is wood, a type of humanity, overlaid with gold, completely covered over with gold, which is the type of the nature of God. So God isn't trying to get rid of you as an individual. He is trying to cover over you with his own nature. Okay, and thou shalt make it unto it a crown of gold round about, and two golden rings shalt thou make to it under the crown of it, by the corners thereof, upon the two sides of it, um, shalt thou make it. And they shall be for places for the staves to bear it withal. And thou shalt make the staves of sheet and wood, and overlay them with gold. And thou shalt put it before the veil, that is by the ark of the testimony, before the mercy seat, that is over the testimony where I will meet with thee. God is telling us that there's a place that he wants to meet with us. And it's not external, but it's internal. Spirit and soul. The Holy of Holies is a place that is descriptive of the spirit of man. The place when the Holy Spirit comes in, he comes in spirit to spirit. But his desire is to minister to your soul that the soul and the spirit might become one with them because they are both spiritual entities. We actually live, some people, they twist it or tweak it or don't believe it, but we live in a parallel universe. The Bible tells us in the book of Job that in a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before God, Satan was there in the midst of them. So, listen, there's things going on in the invisible world that we typically are not cognizant of unless we have the illumination of the Holy Spirit and he opens our eyes to see, as he did with Balaam in Numbers 22, when God opened Balaam's eyes after Balaam's ass was talking to him and tried to rub him off and laid down on him because he saw the angel of the Lord and the ass began to speak to Balaam, and Balaam was having a conversation with his own uh, ass, his own mule, and he, he didn't realize the folly of what he was doing, and yet God then opened his eyes to see in a realm of the spirit that he hadn't been able to see before, blinded by his own fleshy appetites, avarice, greed, whatever it was, lust for position, but it caused him to go out and away from God. And so the golden of altar of incense is talking about the realm of the soul of man, the final place before you enter in to what is called the overshadowing that was described in Luke 1.37. For the Holy Spirit overshadowed Mary and that seed that was planted in her was planted of the Holy Spirit and that resulting embryo was Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Not an engineering work or a biological work of man, but a work of the power of God exercised by faith in Mary. Be it done unto me according to thy word. That's what she said, and that's what happened. The golden, of altar, the golden altar of incense was two cubits tall. Hmm? How much is a cubit? Well, in one sense, it doesn't really matter because the significant part of this discussion is two. But I will tell you, um, traditionally, we believe that a cubit was about 18 inches. So you're talking about three feet tall, okay? And it was one cubit wide in both directions, one long, one wide, and it was four square. It was made of acacia wood, which is referred to in the Bible as, a, as sheetum wood, and it was very durable and hard wood. Think about that. In, within the framework of the soul of man is the mind, the will, the emotions, and the desires. Spoken of in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 1, and the book of Revelation, chapter 4, where it talks about the nature of these aspects of the man's soul was also described in animal form. The mind was as an eagle. Your mind has the power to fly off. The emotions were as a lion. Hmm? Like a roar, sometimes our emotions, rah, they come out. The will is that of an ox. Have you ever heard stubborn as an ox? And desires was the form of a man. No creature desires 
like men desire. Men desire position, men desire women, men desire wealth, uh, men desire cars and lands and many things. Have you ever noticed that the animal kingdom is not bogged down by many of these problems? It's not about desires. It's about a biological response. But God has made us lower than the angels, but on the pinnacle of his creation in the earth. And he said in Genesis that we should be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it. And so we come to this place where God is going to deal with the soul of man, the very most intricate part of his being, the eternal part of who he is. Who you are is a soul. You are an eternal soul and you're going to live forever. Not in this box, but your soul will live forever. All right. Um, it was uh, two cubits tall and one cubit wide and one cubit broad, a square of about 18 inches on the top. Um, this acacia wood, which is the Bible calls Shedham wood, was very hard and durable, and it was a type like cedar. Bugs weren't into it, and it could withstand a lot of, of um, weather conditions. They even made ships and boats with it. Um, it had a crown around the top and four horns on the corners of the altar with hooks. Mm -hmm. um, and it made it easier for one man to lift. The priest had to use it in the Holy of Holies once a year to burn incense before the Ark of the Covenant to fill the Holy of Holies with smoke before the offering could be made for the people. Now, there was a necessity on the priest that he should be clean and, and without um, any uh, spot or wrinkle. And so he had to take care of himself before going in, and then he would go in. The symbolic meaning of the dimensions of uh, the altar speaks of the square number, which represents God, which is one. And the two cubits in height represents two, the number of witness, which is the word and the spirit. So you have the oneness or the uniqueness of God, one by one on top, and the um, necessity of the witness, the spirit and the word. And the crown that is on the top of the altar is a symbol of victory. Uh, of the believer entering into kingship. The Bible said we're kings and priests unto our God, but it is by no means a finished work the first time we read it. It is, it is delivering to us the, the, the knowledge of our own potential that only comes as we submit to Christ and the Word of God. And so God is telling us what is our potential. It's kingship, kings and priests unto our God. Um, in, in, on the table of showbread, the crown was, was um, victory, but it was accompanied with tribulation as well. In this instance, tribulation is past, and the pure essence of the soul is about to be um, given up to God by an offering of fire. Uh, this is a, is a critical step to becoming kings and priests of God. There's two gold rings in which the staves were put, and they symbolize the believer um, having reached the stage of being married, becoming one in both the spirit and the word. It, you know, um, he said that um, for this cause, a man shall leave his father and mother. This is um, Adam who had, uh, didn't have a natural father or mother, but he prophesied, for this cause, a man will leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. So that one fleshness is a, a type and a shadow, a symbolic um, description of the desire of God to become one with his creation, okay? All the symbolism uh, points to the individual. Um, it's a international and a historic event um, that so many individuals will reach that point and the church, the international church, the body of Christ will be changed by the magnitude of that power. The wood that is in this altar that you do not see is a type of humanity, and the gold is the pure nature of God which covers the humanity. Uh, there are two, there are two sac uh, uh, um, altars of sacrifice in the tabernacle. One is at the beginning, the brazen altar, um, and it was a flesh sacrifice. Um, that was a, it was a type of man being divested of his own righteousness 
and of his sin nature, being delivered from the power and the dominion of sin. The second one is the, the soul, the personality, the giftings, all of the attributes of the soul nature being brought to a higher glory in God, being consumed, um, as it were, by the presence of God. When we first offered ourselves, you look at the natural, it's all uh, nothing that was presentable before God. And he really described in the New Testament or in the Old Testament that you take the skin and the dung and the bowels and everything and you take it away. You don't use that. And now uh, the nature of our soul has been changed. The progressive work of the Holy Spirit is to bring metamorphosis to the soul of man. And the golden altar of incense is a, the symbolic description of this final work of the Holy Ghost in the metamorphic process. Um, our beasts, that, those wild beasts, the eagle, the lion, the ox, the man, they've been tamed by the working of the Spirit of God in man. And we begin to manifest the nature and the Spirit of Christ moving into a higher level. Um, and at the point, look at the gifts of God, the gift of healing, discernment, the word of wisdom, the word of knowledge. All of these things are on the altar. They are all attributes of God, gifts of God planted in you for the purpose of bringing you into a higher nature with Christ in Christ. And those things, you know, sometimes we can get high-minded. Oh, boy, maybe I could pray for you and you could get healed. Listen, it's not you. It's Christ in you, the hope of glory. It's the power of God. We are mere conduits of the power. There is a requirement of obedience and submission for which God will reward us, but the power is of God. He said, we have this treasure in earthen vessels, huh? but the excellency is of God that no man should boast. It's not fleshy, intellectual, um, academic exercise. It is revelation that brings us into a higher place of fellowship and interaction with our maker. Um, the priest puts incense on the altar and lights it and moves it as it begins to smoke. If the smoke goes up, it means that God um, accepted the offering, and this is a type of the soulishness of man. Soulishness must die. The in incense is consumed. Jesus, though he had all power, hmm, he never exercised it, but he gave it back to the Father. Outside of God, he, he did not use his power. He said, I don't do anything except I see my Father do it. I don't say anything except I hear him say it. Um, this is a place where, where man doesn't even use his gifts after his own will without being directed expressly by God. If you remember the story at the uh, pool of Bethesda, there were many people that were sick and afflicted, but Jesus only went to one man, and then he went away. Why? because that was the will of God at the moment. This man, God had prepared his heart to receive that which Jesus was going to give to him. We don't really see clearly the aspect. We want to rush out and do this and that and the other thing, and we don't know that God has prepared the heart of the individual to receive that which God would give him, which is necessary, and it's God's business. Our business is to hear God and to do accordingly. You remember the story uh, in Acts, I believe it's chapter 8, that Philip was told to go south on the road to Jerusalem. Hmm. There's probably more than one road south to Jerusalem, but he, he knew intuitively in the spirit, and he went south, and he ran into a eunuch that was in a chariot that was of Candace's court, who was reading the book of Isaiah about Jesus Christ, but it said as a lamb that was led to the slaughter, and, and Philip said, do you understand what you read? He said, no, how am I going to understand this? Somebody explain it. Philip got up in the chariot, explained to him what was necessary for him to be saved. They came to a pool. He said, hey, here's water here. Why can't I get baptized right now? Boom, they went down the water. He received the Lord. He was baptized and delivered from sin. And he come up out of the water and immediately Philip disappeared from him. That's the power of God. 
to translate a man from one place to a neck, another place geographically. We're not talking about Philip's own power. We are talking about the Holy Ghost within, and that's what God is talking about, that he wants us to come to the place where we're not willing to use the gift of God that has been planted in us for our own benefit or our own personal edification. We should not try to capitalize on the gift of God, you know, selling the things that God has given us or, or trying to make merchandise of the gifting. We see way too much of that in the church today. Uh, by the way, I, the, some of the notes that I'm reading, I have a, a book that's available. Uh, it's called The Pattern, written by Cecil J. Ducille. That is available uh, for a free will offering. And if you, don't have, if you don't have anything and you would like a copy of the book, you can, you can receive a copy by writing to me, Peter Schneider, at Bethel House of Refuge, P.O. Box 88, Muhammad, Illinois, 61853. I'll give you the address at the end of the program again. But if you'd like a copy, it's, it's made available on a free will offering basis. Um, if, if you have substance to offer, then please, by all means, do it. It'll cover the cost of printing. We're not looking to engrandize ourselves or make ourselves um, prosperous on the back of this brother's writing. But it is a tremendous book. And it will really open our hearts and minds to the uh, symbolism of the tabernacle of Moses and the necessity to understand it for the New Testament end time church. Now, there were horns on the altar. There were four on the corner. And typically, in the brazen altar, the horns were used to uh, tie the sacrifice down. It wasn't something that was willing. The cow didn't just come in. The bull didn't just you know, press in and jump up on the altar. There was a constraint. There was a force that's required. Even as the force that we require to bring us into a place of submission to the things of God. Our carnal Adamic nature is at odds with God. In Romans 8, it says that the carnal man is not subject to the law of God. The carnal mind, the thinking process, is not subject to the law of God. Neither indeed can it be. And so what you're talking about, it said it's enmity against God. It is in opposition. The natural mind as it is, the unsaved, dark, natural mind in human beings is in direct opposition to the mind of God in the earth. And it has to be brought in to subjection to the will of God. And circumstances of life begin to bring us into the place where we begin to know and understand that in and of ourselves we do not have the power to do for ourselves what we'd like done and we realize by revelation that Jesus Christ has already done those things that need to be done in order for us to be delivered from the nature and disposition of sin that has ruled and reigned in our lives and so Jesus did the work we just have to believe and receive and apply those things that we hear from God in our day-to-day -day walk. The horns of the altar, they are a type of force. It, it depicts a type of force, of a necessity to bring us into the place um, of a continued metamorphosis because we are not finished here. All of the giftings, all of the anointings, all of the wisdom of God, all of the things that God has done for us and in us have to be placed on the altar. And this is the last compulsory act, the required act before we come into the Holy of Holies or the presence of God. And that is complete and absolute submission to the will of the Father. At this point in man's spiritual achievement represents um, uh, one of the major crossroads of the spirit. Man here is asked to submit all that he has attained and achieved in Christ and to learn the great lesson of power that it must be submitted to a higher power. All authority has to be under authority before it has any authority at all. Uh, the lesson persists in the fact that the road to entering into the Father is a way of surrender of all things that the Father has given to man. This is the pattern right along from the outer court. The grain of corn falls into the earth and dies so that it might bring forth many more grains. Now, our self-life is given up so that one might gain the life that is in Christ, the life of Christ. 
and all that one has gained in Christ is being surrendered to gain the fullness which is only in him. What are the consequences of refusing this step? The golden altar is a place of life, but it's also a place of death. Uh, one must remember that when one enters into the life of Christ, one must give up his own life. Hmm. It stands out as a truth, therefore, that to enter into the very fullness of the life of Christ, one must settle the question of the self-life and all other alien types of life upon which the covenant of the outer court was sealed and signed with blood. There is a fear fearful record of death at the golden altar. Leviticus chapter 10, verse 1 and 2 records the death of Nadab and Abihu, two sons of Aaron, Levitical priests. In our time, it represents not only ministers, but those who have reached that stage in Christ. Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took either of them his censer and put fire therein and put incense thereon. He's talking about this right here, the golden altar of incense, and offered strange fire before the Lord, that which he commanded them not. Do you understand? It's not, it's, they offered something that God had not commanded them to do. This is a place of total submission and total restraint that you cannot, must not move in the strength of your own thought life or your own spiritual experience, but only by the word of God, by the power of the Holy Spirit. And God has been teaching us all along the way to govern our innermost being under the governorship of the Holy Spirit. Now, what happened? He, they offered fire, strange fire, which he commanded them not. And there went out fire from the Lord and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. Then Moses said unto Aaron, This is that the Lord spake, saying, I will be sanctified in them that come nigh unto me, and before all the people I will be glorified. And Aaron, their father, held his peace. And Moses called Mishael and Elazaphan, the sons of Uziel, the uncle of Aaron, and said unto them, Come near. Carry your brethren from before the sanctuary out of the camp. So they went near and carried them in their coats out of the camp, as Moses had said. And Moses said unto Aaron and unto Eleazar and unto Ithamar, his sons, who were the brothers of Nadab and Abihu, uncover not your heads, neither rend, rend your clothes, lest you die, lest wrath Come upon all the people, but let your brethren, the whole house of Israel, bewail the burning which the Lord hath kindled. And you shall not go out from the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, lest you die. For the anointing oil of the Lord is upon you. And they did according to the word of Moses. God did not kill these people. They transgressed basic principle and became victims of their own folly. No other fire was to be used in the tabernacle but the fire from the outer court altar of the sacrifice which God himself had lit, and which was a holy fire to be perpetuated. They disregarded instructions and experimented in the things of God. All this sounds very familiar, doesn't it? Men and women of our day are transgressing in this very thing at the altar of incense and are deed dropping dead both physically and spiritually. Adam was created of God a living soul, but Adam died. Since that time, the perfect will of God for man has been to see man move again, not only into life, but into immortality. 2 Timothy 1.10, But now is made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death and hath brought life and immortality to life through the gospel. We've got a lot of information here. I think we should stop, and we'll be back next week to continue our discussion, but I would like to remind you, if you'd like a copy of the book, The Pattern, you can receive one by writing to me, Peter Schneider, S-C-H-N-E-I-D-E-R, at Bethel House of Refuge, P.O. Box 88, Muhammad, Illinois, 61853. If you have an offering, please enclose it. We'll get it in the mail right away. If you don't have the substance to do that, we would like to send you one so that you might be encouraged and strengthened. Lord, we thank you for your presence today. We ask your blessing upon the hearers of the word that their lives might be changed for the better. 
in Jesus' name. Thank you and God bless you.